In case of subtotal thyroidectomy, most of the thyroid gland is removed. Only the posterior part of the thyroid gland is kept in uh, position. Uh, first of all, there is a transverse incision in the skin above the suprasternal notch. And it is a transverse so that it is parallel to the Langer's lines, which are circumferential in the neck, in order to uh, avoid uh, too much granulation tissue and an ugly scar during healing. Then the platysma and the investing fascia are opened longitudinally. The investing fascia is opened longitudinally in between the uh, strap muscles and in between the anterior jugular veins. And then the pretracheal fascia is uh, divided. The arteries and the veins, all of them are tied and all but the posterior part of the thyroid gland is kept in position. It is kept in position uh, because it uh, contains the um, parathyroid gland, so we ensure that the parathyroid glands are not removed, and because uh, um, to keep a certain amount of thyroid tissue that can maintain the function of the uh, thyroid gland, and uh, in, in this case, the remaining part of the thyroid gland, it can get its blood supply even though the all arteries are ligated, but still there is an anastomosis with the tracheal and esophageal arteries. This anastomosis is enough to supply the remaining thyroid tissue. Of the anatomical complications of thyroidectomy, we have vascular injury, uh, particularly th that affecting the middle thyroid vein because this vein is short and wide. It should be ligated first during thyroidectomy to allow manipulation of the thyroid gland without injuring or tearing uh, the, uh, this short vessel. Organ injury like injury of the trachea or esophagus because of the proximity and this is likely to occur particularly in cases of uh, tumor affecting the thyroid gland. Injury of the parathyroid gland, like inadvertent removal of the parathyroid glands during thyroidectomy. And even in total thyroidectomy, the surgeon should uh, at least find one of the four parathyroid glands and try to preserve it to maintain the function of the parathyroids. Injury of the pleura is likely to take place in case of a big goiter extending into this, the superior mediastinum, retrosternal goiter. Nerve injuries include injury of the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which can result in hoarseness or stridor. External laryngeal nerve, which results in weakness of voice and low-pitched sound. Injury of the uh, cervical sympathetic trunk can result in Horner's syndrome. You can see here in this horizontal section of the neck, you can see the location of the sympathetic trunk. It is not as close to the thyroid gland as the recurrent laryngeal nerve, but we can expect that the sympathetic trunk might be affected, might be injured during operation, or even might, might be compressed by a tumor of the thyroid gland. Uh, it is located outside the carotid sheath, outside the pretracheal fascia, and outside the prevertebral fascia the cervical sympathetic trunk, which is an extension upwards of the thoracic sympathetic trunk. If this uh, trunk is injured, it results in Horner's syndrome, which is uh, ptosis, meiosis, anhydrosis, and uh, flushing of the face. The uh, cervical sympathetic trunk, just to emphasize the cervical sympathetic trunk, has no white rami communicants from the cervical spinal nerves and the preganglionic fibers, they ascend upwards from the thorax. There are three ganglia, superior, middle and inferior cervical ganglion. The inferior cervical ganglion may sometimes fuse with the first thoracic ganglion to form the stellate ganglion. Postganglionic fibers of the sympathetic trunk, the gray rami communicants, they usually accompany, or some of them accompany the arteries, whether the uh, external or internal carotid artery, and 
they are distributed to their destination. Either they are distributed to the skin, the uh, blood vessels of the skin or the sweat glands, or they are distributed to the eyeball where they supply the uh, dilator pupillary muscle. And so if the dilator pupillary muscle is paralyzed, this results in meiosis. And also they supply the uh, levator palpebri superioris, the muscle of the eyelid. Actually, they supply the smooth muscle part of levator palpebri superioris, and this will result in uh, ptosis. The thyroid gland uh, develops embryologically as a diverticulum from the floor of the embryonic uh, pharynx, and it grows gradually uh, superficial to the hyoid bone. The stem of the diverticulum, which is called the thyroglossal duct, usually disappears and after the tongue has uh, developed the point of outgrowth of the thyroglossal duct is called the foramen cecum. Cecum means blind-ended. So uh, this is foramen cecum at the dorsum of the tongue between the anterior two-thirds and posterior third of the tongue is the remains of uh, the diverticulum of the thyroid, the thyroglossal duct. Now, if the um, uh, th thyroglossal duct uh, fail uh, to disappear, part of it will remain and may become insisted and result in a thyroglossal cyst, usually in the midline of the neck. And this cyst is connected the dorsum of the tongue and that's why it can move upwards when the tongue is protruded which is uh, characteristic for the thyroglossal cyst. Sometimes the thyroid gland fails to descend from its original uh, origin and the dorsum of the tongue and this will result in the formation of a lingual thyroid. An ectopic thyroid may appear between the foramen cecum and the normal position and sometimes the thyroid gland may descend too far and be found in the superior mediastinum intrathoracic thyroid. As for the parathyroid glands, there are two of these glands on each side. We can see them in this photograph and in this diagram. Two on each side superior and inferior parathyroids they are yellow brown in color about the size of a small pea and they secrete the parathormone that mobilizes bone calcium and increases gut and kidney calcium absorption located posterior to the thyroid gland they are located within the pretracheal fascia but outside the capsule of the thyroid uh, gland uh, the superior parathyroid gland is more constant in its position, is located a short distance above the entry of the inferior thyroid artery and developed from the endoderm of the fourth pharyngeal pouch, while the inferior parathyroid gland is more variable in position and is usually embedded behind the lower pole but is often found elsewhere, uh, even may be present in the superior mediastinum and develops from the endoderm of the third pharyngeal arch where the thymus develops and uh, the thymus, therefore, may carry the inferior parathyroid with it when it descends into the thorax.